Greetings everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll discuss how to manage risk at work. As always, I'm delighted to have you all here with us. My name is Susanna Ayeti and I'm an account manager for AGC and the PCB's organizer for this session. This webinar will be presented by PCB Certified Trainer and Managing Director of FB Food Safety and Quality Management Systems, Ms. Faye Anderson. Among many things, Ms. Anderson will cover workplace transportation, fire safety and noise. During the presentation, you will certainly have questions that you would like to get the answers to. So please feel free to write your questions and comments in the question box in the right-hand control panel, or you can use the raise hand function. We will unmute you and you will uh, have a chance to ask the question directly to Ms. Anderson. Also, if you're aware of topic that you would like to discuss and participants would benefit from, please feel free to write down your suggestions in the survey at the end of the webinar. We are strongly committed to providing our audience with updated and useful information. Please, Ms. Anderson, you may start the presentation. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. This morning, we look at how to manage risk at work, and I will focus on three areas, workplace transportation, fire safety, and noise. Looking at workplace transportation, some things that we should do, mark the, trans the traffic tr pedestrian movement. Um, okay, that's what I need to do. Okay. Oh, good. Yes. I'm sorry about that. We need to mark the traffic and pedestrian movements on a plan so you can see where pedestrians and vehicles interact, meaning that you need to have a flow, flow of traffic, so you have an idea where your vehicle will, will move in your, in your workplace. Identify developments that will reduce the contact between pedestrians and vehicles. You really don't want to have vehicles and pedestrians walking in the same directions all the time. So you need to like have a walkway for your pedestrians, separate and apart. Take for instance, you have your, your roadways, Vehicles drive on the road, but you have your path where pedestrians would walk. So you need to really mark that clearly because you, don't, you want to avoid all these accidents. Remember to take account of less frequent tasks. Example, your waste kit and so on. You're not really going to be going to change your waste kit every minute. So you take account of those when you're marking your flow. Look cautiously at other vehicles and people moving around your workplace. So you really need to, as a worker, you really need to look and see, look at your forklifts, look at your trailers, look at all these things that really have to move around your workplace. So you know where they are moving at all times, so you know where you need to walk. We really want to minimize the risk of accidents there. Make sure you consider drivers as they are particularly vulnerable. The delivery drivers, they're always in a, sometimes when delivery drivers come in, they're not really looking they are not very conscious about the workplace. They are delivering, they are picking up, they are dropping off. So you really need to take those into consideration. Sometimes they don't really think about the risk. Of course, you have to train them if, if they are regulars and so on. But sometimes some of these guys who come in, they really don't think about the risk that can happen in the workplace. They are just going about their, their duties. Plan your workplace so that pedestrians are safe from vehicles, provide a one-way system, and I did mention that to some extent. So you know workers, your, work, your workers will walk in one direction, your vehicles will be in one direction. Offer suitable cross points where pedestrians and traffic meet. You really, even though it's, it's a work environment, make sure that workers, they have a point where they cross, just like on the road. You have your pedestrians crossing at that point. So they don't walk, they're not walking before all of these forklifts and trailers in, in, in their everyday side. They know they have to go to a point and this is where I cross. And when you do that, the transportation or the drivers of these transportation, they will know that it's likely that someone may be crossing at this point. So they will be looking out for your pedestrians. Provide separate routes for pedestrians and vehicles where possible. Avoid reversing where possible. So if you don't have to have these guys reversing with your forklifts and all that, because some of the most, sometimes you will have accidents from forklifts because I've been into 
I've been into um, work environments where there are no signs. So you really have to be looking out for them. They're reversing some of these guys. They really feel like you should be looking for them. So they, they are not even looking at you when they're reversing. So you want to avoid them having to reverse as much as possible. Use your highway code signs to direct vehicle roads, special limits, pedestrian crossing, etc. So you need to, on the workplace, you need to say to them, this is the speed limit in this zone. So they really know that they're not supposed to be speeding. Once they enter your work environment, you have to cut your speed limits. And you have your pedestrian crossing. I mentioned that before. So they know that's where they need to cross. They don't really walk across Vita where drivers are not expecting to see someone. Make sure you have good lighting where people and vehicles are working. Make sure that you can see. They can see the vehicle and the vehicle will be able to see them. So lighting is good. Make sure you, you don't have a forklift driving or running into a dark, dark storeroom or dark warehouse where it's unlikely that they're going to see someone. So make sure the lighting is good. Make sure there are safe areas for loading and unloading. Again, make sure that you're you're loading, you're loading docks and all you're receiving errors, those are safe for persons. So you don't really, you cut down on accidents there. Try to provide separate parking for visitors that they may not know your site. And make sure the road surface are firm and even. So if you try to make sure that when, I, when your visitors drive in, they have a certain point that they don't go beyond. So that you have a parking parking space for visitors. They don't really drive onto your, your, your environment. And that time they also, because if I drive into a work environment and I don't really know where to park, I too will run the risk of colliding in their trailers, their any vehicle that they may have driving. Make sure that visitors parking are, are marked and separate. Fit rollover protective structures and use seat belts where fitted. So you still need to use your feet, your seat belts. Remove the need for people to climb upon vehicle where possible. Example by providing gauges and controls that are accessible from ground level. Provide reversing aids such as a CCTV where appropriate. So make sure you provide aids for them so they can see when they're reversing. They can see if someone is behind them. Make it as easy as possible for them. Because, you know, in the workplace, you might be busy. You're picking up. You're dropping off. It's not even like when you're driving. So you might want to get things done quickly. So make sure you provide as much aid as possible. Reduce the risk of falling when people have to climb onto a vehicle or a trailer by providing well-constructed ladders, non-slip walkways, and guardrails where possible. So again, you need to make sure that people really don't fall off these vehicles. Because sometimes you have to do you have to, have to do some climbing. So you reduce that risk. You make sure they have all the aids, guardrails. They can hold on. It's not too slippery and all of that. Ensure the, the vehicles are suitable for the purpose for which they are used, right? And as you see in my picture, where you have all of those trucks that are overloaded, right? Maintain vehicles in good repair, particularly the braking system, steering tires, lights, mirrors, and specific safety system. So you have to make sure you, you provide your maintenance. You do your, your, your maintenance and your vehicles. So you really don't run the risk. Your preventative maintenance, you don't run the risk of them breaking down and causing causing accidents. They're always in good working, working condition. Make sure your drivers are trained. They should be trained. The, the, the ones with the forklifts and all, they should be trained and they should know how to operate these forklifts. Reassess the lift truck operators at a regular intervals and make sure that when you have new risks that arise, you put them into the work practices, you retrain them because where every day things change, new things comes about. So make sure you retrain your forklift operators and they are introduced to new working practices and changes that may come about. Train the drivers of other vehicles to a similar standard. 
make sure that all your drivers are trained, they are retrained, they are refreshed, and everything that comes about you. So you, you go about your refresher training about three to five years. Make sure that they are really on top of everything. Make sure that all the drivers are supervised. And these should include those visiting your site. So they shouldn't be doing their own thing or driving like they're really out there on the road. Make sure that they're supervised. They're on your property, your premises. Make sure that they really abide by your rules, your regulations, and all the, the, the rules that you may have. The, the next, um, another one of the safety hazards that I wanted to look at this morning was your fire safety hazards. And we find that sometimes in our workplace we ignore some things. But most of these fires are preventable. They are um, those responsible for workplaces and other buildings to which the public have access can avoid them by taking responsibility. Fires come about by three things. You must be a source of ignition, you must have fuel, and you must have oxygen. So if you eliminate one or all of these, you can prevent your, your fires. You need to make sure that you take all of these into consideration. So general fire safety hazards, sources of ignition include your heaters, lighters, naked flames, and all of these. Anything else that can get very hot and cause sparks. And fuel would be like your wood, paper, plastic, all of these. And we will agree that all of these are in the work environment. We can find any of this in your, and of course, your oxygen. And that's the air around us. What do you have to do? Employers must carry out a fire safety risk assessment and keep it up to date. Meaning that you're going to look look around your environment, look at all the things that will possible that can possibly cause a fire. Look at all the risk involved. This shares the same approach as health and safety risk assessment and can be carried out either as a part of an overall risk assessment or as a separate exercise. So you can do your fire safety risk assessment separately or you can do it as your overall risk assessment in your, of your organization. So you're going to look at all the things that are possible, possibilities of causing fire. Look at the risk and see how you can minimize those. To help prevent wind fire in the workplace, your risk assessment should identify what could cause a fire to start. Example, the source of ignition and substances that burn and the people who may be at risk. So you need to make sure you do your risk assessment because it's likely that fire will or can happen, but what we are trying to do here is to minimize or eliminate these risks. Once you have identified the risk, you can take the appropriate action. You're going to consider whether you can avoid them altogether or if this is possible, if not possible, you can reduce the risk. So you're going to consider if you can reduce it or eliminate them. Also, you need to consider how you will protect yourself and peep other persons if there is really a fire. So when you're going to carry your fire safety risk assessment, keep your sources of ignition and flammable substances apart, right? Because we really need, we have to have these in the workplace, so you really need to keep them apart. Avoid Accidental fires, example, you're going to make sure that your heaters are not blocked or knocked over or anything like that. So these are things that you're going to avoid, avoid things that can really happen. Ensure you have good housekeeping at all times. Avoid buildup of rubbish that can burn. Consider how to detect fires and how to warn people quickly if they start. Example, you have your smoke alarm or your fire extinguishers or your fire alarms and so on. So if, if a fire is there, your, your smoke detector will pick it up and an alarm will go off. Have the correct firefighting equipment for putting a fire out quickly. So again, when you're doing your risk assessment, you would 
look at the likelihood of the fire and if this happens, what kind of fire extinguishing equipment you would require to put that out quickly and so on. So it depends on your establishment and when you conduct your risk assessment, you will also look at the equipment that you will need. Keep fire exits and escape routes clearly marked and unobstructed at all times. And that speaks for itself because um, you really want to make sure that people really can get out. Because I don't know if you've ever been into an organization where exits, exit doors are blocked, particularly in a warehouse sometimes. And I have seen it where you have exit doors and you have cart and boxes and so on stocked against those doors. You really can't have that. Your exits have to be clear at all times. Ensure your workers receive appropriate training on procedures they need to follow, including fire drills. So again, you're going to train your workers in all these procedures relating to fire, and you're going to do your, your fire drills. You're going to conduct the fire drills. Let them be aware when there's a fire, how do they operate? How do we move? around, how do we get out, and so on. You, so you'll have your fire drills. Review and update your risk assessment regularly. So like in everything that we do, you have to review and assess because it depends on how you're changing your organization or depends on what new you're doing or what you're not doing anymore. You really have to review and assess so you can update and, and make sure that whatever you have in place is current. Dangerous substances that cause fire and explosion. Work which involves the storage, use, and creation of chemicals, vapors, dust, and all of these that can readily burn or explode is hazardous. Each year, people are injured at work, and these flammable substances accidentally cause fire or exploding. So again, you have to take into consideration if you have any of these how you're going to minimize these risks. Many substances found in the workplace can cause fires or explosion. It's important to be aware of the risk and to control or get rid of them to prevent these accidents. So again, you have to be aware of all the risk involved in whatever you are storing, whatever you're using, whatever equipment you have, and all the risk, and how you can minimize and get rid of and prevent these accidents. You're going to identify what substance or material processes actually have the potential to cause such an event. and what you're going to do, you're also going to identify people who may be at risk or harm. So you're going to identify the persons who work closely in these areas. You're going to identify persons, the nature of their jobs. And you're also going to identify if these are the persons who, if there is a fire or something, if they are going to be the first. So you need to, you need to put plans in place to make sure that you protect these people or you need to make sure that you train them and they are aware of all of these, these risks. Once you have identified the risk, you should consider what measures are needed to reduce or remove the risk of people being harmed. This will include measures to prevent the accidents happening in the first place, as well as precautions that will protect people from harm if there's a fire or there's an explosion. Key points to remember, think about the risk of fire and explosion from the substances you use or create in your business and consider how, to, how you might remove or reduce the risk. Use supplier safety data sheets as a source of information about which substances might be flammable. So you're going to look at your data sheets, you're going to look at the ingredients in the substances that you have and you're going to see if they may contain flammable ingredients. You're going to use those sheets to guide you. Remember reducing the amount of flammable explosives or substances you store in sight. 
So again, you can look at see how you can store some of these things offsite in a more, you know, in a safer environment if you can. Keep sources of ignition, naked flames and so on, and substances that burn apart. So remember, if these sources don't come together, they won't ignite. So make sure you keep them as much as possible apart. Get rid of flammable explosives substances safely. Review your risk assessment regularly. Maintain good housekeeping. Yeah, you're going to avoid built up of rubbish things that will ignite easily and you know, cause fire to spread. You also need to consider the presence of dangerous substances that can result in fires and explosions as a part of your fire safety risk assessment. Let's look at noise. This is something that sometimes we don't really think that it's a hazard or it can be serious, but yes, it can be. So we really have to make sure that we, we look at noise and see how we can protect our employees. Loud noise at work can damage your hearing. This usually happens gradually and may only be when the damage caused by noise combined with hearing loss due to aging that people realize and how impaired their hearing has become. So some of the times these things happen to us when we are older and it's really because of some risk that we took at work, I mean 10 years ago. So we have to make sure that we, we control this. Not because it's not affecting you, no. You really have to make sure you minimize it and you control it. This can cause hearing damage that is permanent and disabling. It can be gradual from exposure to noise over time, I just mentioned that, but damage can also be caused by sudden extremely loud noises. This damage is disabling and it can, be st it can stop people from being able to understand speech, keep up with conversations or use a telephone. So you need to make sure that you protect yourself from noise. I don't know with the the attack they had in Brussels last week, if you remember, most of those persons from that loud noise, most of them, their, their ears drum burst. So noise is that, is, is that bad. It's just as serious. Hearing loss is not the only problem. People may develop tetanus, and this is ringing. You, you, I don't know if you ever heard person say that they hear this continuous ringing or buzzing in the ears. It's very uncomfortable, it's distressing condition which can lead to disturbed sleep. And I mean that must be uncomfortable. Noise at work can in interfere with communications and make warnings harder to hear. It can also reduce a person's awareness of his or her surroundings and these can lead to Save the risk, putting people at risk of injury or death. Because if you're really not hearing as you ought to, you're not going to hear when a fog if it's coming. You're not going to hear a lot of things, and this will put you and others at risk. If you if you're you're not going to hear if someone is really calling to you, telling you to that the danger is about to happen. So you need to make sure you minimize that. You will probably need to do something about it if the following apply. If, the, if noise is intrusive, like a busy street, a vacuum cleaner, or a crowded restaurant, or worse than intrusive, for most of the work day, you might have you might be in a noisy environment. You have to do something about that. Your employees have to raise their voices to have a normal conversation when about two meters apart for at least part of the day, and that's because of the noise in the environment. Your employees use noisy power tools or machinery for more than half an hour a day. So if, you, if, you, if all of these, you really have a problem and you should really do something about it. Your sector is known to have noisy tasks, example construction, work site, road repair, all of these woodworking, you have all these machinery going in and so on. It's, not, it's a noisy environment that you're working in. 
there are noises due to impact, such as hammering, drop fogging, pneumatic impact tools, explosive, all of this, you need to take this into consideration. That's how you're going to know that you're going to assess again the work environment, assess the kind of work that is going on, assess all of the things that happen, and then this is how you're going to know you really need to, to fix the problem or do something again to minimize. Situations where you need to consider safety issues in relation to noise include where you use warning sounds to avoid or alert to dangerous situations, eh? and I mentioned that earlier. Working practices rely on verbal communications. There's a work around mobile machinery or traffic. So you really don't want to know that you are minimizing. Because of noise, persons can't hear, or they are not as alert as they ought to be. How are you going to control these? There are many ways of reducing noise and explosion. Nearly all businesses can decide on practical, cost-effective actions to control noise risk. First, think about how to remove the source of the noise altogether. For example, housing the noise the machine where it cannot be heard by workers. If that is not possible, you need to investigate. So again, if you can put your machinery away if it's noisy where it doesn't affect other workers who really don't have to deal with it you can think about that think if you you know how you can do that things like that or consider using a quieter equipment or a different quieter process engineering technical controls to reduce at source the noise produced by machine or process so again if you have a noisy machine Think of a way in which you can use something to control the noise. Using screen barriers, enclosures, and absorbent material reduce the noise on its path to the people exposed. So again, you can look, look and see how you can minimize the noise. Because sometimes you really can't cut down the noise of the machinery or the noise of the process and so on. But see how we can use other things to minimize it and minimize how much we expose our workers to these noise. Designing a layout of the workplace to create quiet workstations. So again, you can do that for your, your employees. And you can limit the amount of time people spend in the noisy areas. So look, at, look and see how much you can cut down on these, if you can because we really don't want to, to damage anybody's ears eh? and, and, and prevent them from operating in the way they should. You should consider noise alongside other factors, example, general suitability and efficiency. So again, you have, you have to look at these. You have to look and see if this equipment is suitable, if it's efficient, and when you're buying, when hiring or buying equipment, you should take this into consideration. You should compare the noise data from different machines, and this will help you to buy from among the quieter ones. So you really have to do a study and say, do I have to use this machinery or can I use this? It's quieter and it's doing the same work. So you really need to do all your feasibility study there and think when you're buying your machinery, think about the people who, are, who has to use them. When, when should you really be using hearing protection? Hearing protection should be issued to employees where extra protection is needed above what has been achieved using noise control. For short-term protection, while other methods of controlling noise are being developed, you should not use hearing protection as an alternative to controlling noise by technical or organizational means. Employees to whom you provide hearing protection should receive training on how to use them. So again, you need to make sure you train your employees how to use this hearing protection, and you need to also 
educate them on why they're using it. Because I know sometimes we don't use it because it's hot, it's uncomfortable, it's really in the way, but we need to make sure that we train our employees and let them understand why these are provided, why protective, you know, protective equipment are provided for them in the workplace and what why the particular one is provided so they know that it's very important that they use them. If the risk assessment indicates that there's a risk to health for employees exposed to knives, they should be placed on the suitable health surveillance, right? So again, if when you do your risk assessment, you find that the employees who work in that particular area will be affected by this noise, you should make sure that you check them. Check them regularly. Make sure you check the hearing, you know, because you need to make sure you keep on top of the situation. You don't want to wait until 10 years down the line. They've been doing this, working in this environment for 10 years and then this happens down the line. You really need to make sure that you keep checking, do your medical checks. So I thank you very much and I hope that we I was able to enlighten you this morning, and thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anderson, for this presentation. Uh, we will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Uh, the first question is, uh, what happens if an employee refuses to wear hearing protection? I think if an employee refuses to hear wear hearing protection, you really, sh you should maybe, there, there, the ways to deal with this. You can have them sign something, some companies would probably have them sign something so you kind of take yourself away from the situation, but then as an employer you really need to, to wear it. So it might be that you can't work in that area, you can't work here if you refuse to, hear, to wear your hearing protection. So they need to decide, if you're working in here, this is a part of your protective gear. If you don't wear it, you can't work. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, why do employers have to reduce noise at source when workers can just wear hearing protection? I think that sometimes hearing protection is not enough. And um, again, hearing protection sometimes for the same reasons workers is uncomfortable, it's hot, so if we can reduce the noise and if there's any possibility of our reducing the noise as an employer, we really, we really should because what you're doing, you're minimizing and if you really minimize it, you can even decide on a, a different means of hearing protection. So I don't think because hearing protections are there, we should make a noisy environment. We should really try to reduce it. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can I remove or relocate fire equipment or even an emergency exit? Can you, can you ask it again, Suzanne? Yes, it says, can I remove or relocate fire equipment or even an emergency exit? If you, if you remove an emergency exit, I mean, you have to have an emergency exit, so you can um, if you change the location, yes, but you shouldn't remove it completely. You should have you should have your fire equipment. You should have your emergency exit, so you can relocate. But if you re relocate, you have to educate. You have to retrain because persons really need to know where everything is. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is: uh, Can emergency escapes be locked for security reasons? Why would you lock them for security? Emergency escape should be able to be open from inside. So, like, I shouldn't be able to open an emergency door from outside a building, but persons inside should be able to open an emergency escape. Because it, why would you lock it? Suppose something happens and, the peop, and persons have to move from inside. It should be locked from outside, but not inside. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, according to your experience, uh, what are the most common problems that a company may face uh, when putting together a transportation plan? 
I think that in most in most cases when you're putting your transportation plan is that you have limited space and it's going to be hard it is sometimes it's hard for persons if you have a small premises to say well this is where your forklifts are going to drive this is where your trucks are going to drive this is for pedestrian and so on so if you have limited space that is going to be difficult because if if you don't have enough space you really you it's really going to be hard for you to have separate walkways separate driveways you know and things like that so i think that is I find that a lot of time is because of the limited space that they have and sometimes workers are not trained so they need to make sure they train them but on the organ and the organization's point the place is limited it's really hard for them to make sure that they have a good a good map of where people drive and where where pedestrians are okay uh, what would you say is the best period meaning at which time to review the fire risk assessment? I think we should um, we should review it. Well, first, you should re review everything every year. You should review everything every year. But then again, if you have new products, if you have new processes, if you're taking, you know, new parcels on, you really need to make sure that you review everything that you have in place. But you really should be reviewing your fire risk assessment every year. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, in which case can we consider that environment needs to have both, uh, meaning reduced noise measure, and also wear the noisy protection? Give us a basic example. Can you ask me that again? Yes. It says, uh, in which case, can you consider using both uh, the uh, noisy protection, meaning the, the protection you use against the noise, and also reduce the noise? Okay, um, you're asking me in which case you're going to use both? Yes. Okay, like if you're really working on a, um, a construction site, you're going to have heavy machinery, you're going to have noise, you really have to use your hearing aid for that. And you're also going to make sure that the machinery that you're using, if you can minimize the noise as much as possible, you do it. But there are times when you really cannot eliminate it, so you know you have to use both. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, should we conduct reoccurring safety audits? Should you conduct reappearance safety audits? Yes. Yes, you, yeah, you should. You should conduct reappearance safety audits because you really need to make sure that your everything is is always in place. So I, that's something I really recommend that that's done annual to or twice a year if you have to. But you should conduct your your reappearance safety audits. Make okay. sure that everything is in. Place. Sometimes we really ignore that. Okay, thank you. Uh, how often should uh, audiometric tests be carried out for workplaces employee exposed to workplace noise? So meaning how often should the audiometric test in general be carried out? I think you could do that. I know a lot of companies, they do their, their medicals and so on. So we could do that whenever we do those checks. That, that is a part of the check that is done at all times annual. Okay, uh, and the last question is, what is really involved on in minimizing the machine noise? The minimizing the machine noise is where you're going to use, um, and if we go back to the slide, you're going to make sure that you put screens, you put anything that you can suppress the noise, that machinery, the noise is there, but it's really minimized because you're kind of more or less cushioning the noise before it reaches to your employee. Uh, Ms. Anderson, I would like to thank you once again for this great presentation. Uh, I would also like to thank all the attendees for taking the time out, out of their busy schedule to join us. We hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as we did. Uh, we have received all of your questions, and because the time is limited, we will answer to your questions individually by email. Uh, also, don't forget to check PCB's uh, webinar schedule on our website, pcb.com, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel and be updated with our weekly webinars. Uh, next Friday, we will talk about the new standard ISO 4001. Until then, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you, Suzanne.